Hey guys, thanks for subscribing to Bonsai Mirai on YouTube. If you like this video, we have a ton more like it on Mirai Live, including weekly live streams, species and technique features, and weekly live Q&As with Ryan Neal. Start your free trial today at live.bonsaimirai.com. Creating stone planted compositions is one of these ultimate opportunities to reflect nature in miniature. And the process can be extremely intimidating. Follow us through the process as we take some very accessible nursery stock. Learn how you put movement into that nursery stock to over the course of time cultivate those pieces to create stone compositions. And then follow us step by step through the process of creation, the ideas that are involved in it and learn those techniques that allow you to really build and emulate nature in miniature. Today we're going to be working with just some cutoff whips. Now these whips are representative of an air layered piece of material from a mother plant that we have in the garden. And because we have such a limited uh, supply of our air layered pieces, I'm not going to wire this one up. It's not exceptionally healthy, but I wanted to show you what these pieces were supposed to represent so that we can talk about what kind of movement are we going to put into these pieces of material to make sure that over the next four years that they evolve and develop. I'm going to take off some of the weaker spindly stuff at the base so that I don't get wire overlapping any of our foliage or starting to uh, pull some of these branches into that stem. Ultimately, after we put good movement into this uh, whip, we're gonna go ahead and let all of these branches just grow freely to start the thickening process and to start to enhance that movement by that expansion of the tissue. Aluminum, we can unwire, we can straighten it, and we can rewire these whips, and so it becomes a lot more economical to use aluminum. What that means, though, if we wanna have total control over what we're gonna do with this whip, we have to be executing the wiring to perfection and we also have to be making sure that we're using a gauge of aluminum that allows us to accomplish exactly what we want to accomplish. So now, just at that base, we've got that nice angle. We come here, nice tight turn, longer inner node, a little bit of a shorter turn. So we've gone back, we've come forward, we've come up, we've come forward again, and now we're headed back. Now maybe we say, I would really like to add some just really severe movement. Cool, keep rolling with that wire. Keep rolling with that wire, keep making sure that that wire holds that movement as much as it possibly can. This is our thinnest whip. This is probably gonna be that piece and that point where we're gonna be able to generate roots in an air layer on a whip of this size to be able to cultivate material that has this kind of proportion. And notice that there was no limitation. I have no tears, I have no breaks, I have no risk of this perishing. And when we think about the movement of whips, it's great to start with the thinnest material possible to have that drama in that movement. Now we're gonna to go to an intermediate sized whip. This is such a young tree, we're gonna let that wire dig in, we're gonna let that trunk swell. And I'm gonna show you the product of these four years ago as they stand today, still with the initial wire on them. Some of them are not gonna be worthy, a lot of them are gonna be very worthy, and some of them are gonna be very special because of the work that we did four years ago. And when we start to add movement to pieces that have more thickness, one of the things that I wanna encourage you to do, and I want you to listen, don't react to this, I want you to push the bends until they break. Because if you're not breaking a few of those whips in the process, you're not putting in enough dramatic movement to make that interesting. Use fairly thick wire so that you have total control over the movement that you're able to put into this piece. One of the things that we oftentimes do when we're creating material and putting movement in for the first time is we often make that movement very, very soft. And that soft movement, as a tree thickens, starts to be nullified by that thickening process. It softens the movement and eventually we end up with a fairly uninteresting piece of movement in that trunk or that tree. So right here, I've already kind of started off with a coil. I see that tendency. If I rotate this forward, I perpetuate that coil. So my natural instinct to get that organic movement is gonna be to rotate back. 
we've now created from all 360 degrees, and let me just rotate that for you, we've created interesting movement that sets a great foundation. As opposed to just taking a piece and straight bending it, as we rotate and bend, this is why I'm not snapping these pieces. That is the technique of choice. I've got three very different trees that I've created here that will continue to evolve. Okay, so I've pulled up onto the table three pieces that were wired four years ago and ha have just been allowed to grow wild and really develop the tissue and thicken. Now this first one, a little bit more upright, it's got some interesting movement, a lot softer curvature. And we want this diversity of forms to have that variety so we don't have that repetition tree to tree in the overall composition of a rock planting. So now we've got all of the wire off of the whips um, and we've teased out the base of each tree so we can see where that flare begins and really where that point of stability is going to exist to mount these to the stone. Now if we just look at any one of these you'll notice that I left the whole bottom of the root system and the sides intact. So in order to just be aware of what we have but leave the root mass intact to be able to put these back in a container or do whatever we feel is appropriate with the ones we don't use not impacting the root system too much and just focusing on identifying that base is a really smart strategy when we go about stone composition creation. When we start creating a stone planted composition, we've got to be first thinking about and inspired by the stone. Obviously, we can have a tree that we have in mind to plant on a stone and reverse engineer that, but oftentimes it's the stone that starts to create that idea of that environment and that opportunity to build something really special. And this stone started to create the idea that we could have these junipers hanging off of it in a cascading form. We also have a lot of potential for there to be some verticality in our material as well. And this stone so, sort of catalyzed the selection of material that we were going to be utilizing, which is what led us back to these junipers that we put movement in four years ago. We have two major sort of avenues that we can go down in stone composition creation. Oftentimes what we want to start with in terms of that stone is material that's going to take a backseat to that stone. This is one of those chances and opportunities to utilize accessible material in a really creative way to highlight that stone and show that environment. We also have another avenue that we can go down where the tree is the major component in the composition and in this the stone is a minor element. Oftentimes when we create that tree forward, tree focused composition with a stone, we want to reduce the size of the stone, we want to show less of the stone, and we won't, don't want the visual mass of the stone to overpower the tree in the composition. Where we create a more massive soil environment within the stone for the tree to survive on, where we see slabs being utilized in this way, or stones that have the ability to hold the root system of a really impressive tree. Tonight we're going to focus on the stone. We're going to use accessible nursery stock, we're going to reduce the amount of the stone that's covered by the planting composition, and we're really going to touch on that scale and environment that shows the mountains, the cliffs, the hillsides in their full grandeur and shows these trees struggling for survival and interacting with that environmental influence. When we're dealing with a stone that has a very limited amount of soil mass around the roots, those roots have to be able to go somewhere in order to give that longevity of their life on the stone and oftentimes creating a trail from the roots into the container creates that system that allows those trees to thrive and that composition to succeed over the course of time. One thing you'll notice about this stone is it is very very heavy towards the front and once we start to add more and more trees and soil to the tip of this it's going to become very unstable and probably not stand up on its own. As a result, to maximize the drama of this scenario and composition that we're creating and be able to utilize the far extent of this stone and to add longevity to the composition that we create, we are going to be planting this stone or placing this stone into a container. So oftentimes what I'll do is I'll just take a piece of chalk because I know that the chalk is going to wash off with water and I'll kind of mark those points. I might even trace around the places where they exist on the container so that I can see how that feature fits in. 
and I try to give myself on each stone three points of reference to where it interacts with the container. I'm also going to be painting or creating marks, linear marks here, where these stones are supposed to be sort of matching up so that I can get them as close as possible to their original position. So we've got three points that we can anchor. Now one of the most important things to anchoring stone in a container is that we have the most direct connection of, across the shortest possible distance to hold that stone in the container. And what that means is we may have to drill one through the stone and two through the pot to be able to properly secure that stone to the container. Now we're going to come back and we're actually going to prop up these stones at the appropriate angle with wood to make sure that we can anchor this system correctly and protect the ceramic from the impact of the stone with the ceramic surface. We'll start with this small stone here, just taking a look at sort of our three major points where we have to anchor. I notice I have a very solid foot here, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to make myself a little bit of a check mark here for two wires that are going to come out of the drain hole that already exists. Now when these wires come out, I don't want to overlap this stone and show that tie down of those wires. So I'm also going to make just a nice little, little spot here where that one, one of those wires is going to come through the stone. I'm just going to take a standard piece of wood here. I assume the thickness might be a little bit shy of what we need. I'm going to use my root cutters to just split this along that edge to have a nice platform to be able to work with. And I'm just going to give this a little bit of a try. I see that I have a little bit of a gap there, but if I'm using rubber in addition to the wood, I should be able to prop this up exactly as it needs to be supported to keep it off of the bottom of the container and give myself the space here that I need so I have no stone and ceramic contact. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take one of my just generic pieces of bamboo. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to support it here just to get the basic height. Once I have that basic height, I can now conform a block to that space so that I'm able to prop that up on a block as well, anchor to the block and give myself that distance, one, two, three points of contact, one, two, three anchored surfaces, and one, two, three pieces that are going to support this stone when I go to tie it into the container. Now that we have this all marked, I can go ahead and take the stones out, but Anytime that we're trying to recreate a situation in a container where we've laid out that whole process, we've got all of our marks in place to be able to find it. The best way to get back to that point is not to separate your pieces too far or to change their rotation. Notice where I have the stone foot existing right here hanging out of the container. I've got my mark right here where the mark point exists and I've got my wood block as well as the foot traced here, here, I've got my mark here, I know I need two wires here, and I know I need another hole there. We're talking about two check marks here, so I'm just going to change that and I'm always going to erase so that I'm sure of what I'm doing. I've got my two check marks here. Now I just want to show you the bits that we use to be able to create a hole in the container. This is actually a tile bit. Notice the spade-like shape of this bit and it's got a cutting edge here and it's got a cutting edge on the back side here. I'll just rotate that so you can kind of see those. They have the same orientation. So as this spins, the edge of that cuts through the ceramic. I'm going to let the bit do most of the work. I'm not going to be pushing aggressively because even that force with the vibration of the bit could break out the bottom of this container. And over the course of time while I'm drilling, I'm going to be having a spray bottle in my other hand that I'm wetting down that bit to keep it cool so it continues to cut smoothly through the, through the ceramic body and the heat doesn't accumulate to cause more damage. You'll notice in the hole here that the water is not draining through. I heard a little bit of an audio change and a little bit of a textural change. That's probably inconsistencies in the ceramic body itself. You can always pull back and make sure if you go too far and blow out the bottom of the pot, there's no returning from that uh, decision. Notice how we start to see just the point of that and just a small hole there and I'll wet it so that you can see that contrast, okay? Now when we're drilling a container that has any age or any value to it. We always want to be sure to pat it on the work surface so that we're not rattling it against the work surface and also so that we preserve all of this patina on the edge of the container. I'm going to continue to cool as I drill and I'm going to let this go all the way through the container.
When I think about the most secure application of drainage screen wires to give stability, if in a rare instance the stone does have to sit on some of those drainage screen wires, having them laterally so that I have that stability on the widest point of the stone as, as opposed to having them linearly where it could cause the stone to rock is a good strategy to keep in mind and something to be aware of. So in tying this drainage screen down where we would typically go to the longest points of the hole running linearly through the container, I'm actually gonna adjust my strategy to give more stability to the stone if the stone sits on those drainage screen wires. Now we can start to work on those steel tie downs. And again, wire of choice, strong, durable, no possibility of stretching, galvanized steel wire. Now we've got our container set. I'm gonna go ahead and take the blocks that I cut and just make sure that within the wire and where the wire is existing, that these blocks are capable of working. And you'll see something very precarious here. Notice that this block is rotating right on that uh, drainage screen. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cut just a little notch out of the bottom of that block, marking that line, so that I can go ahead and make sure that block has solid contact with the bottom of the container and doesn't move around on that drainage screen wire. Ha 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 ha. Got it. Now I want this block to sit nice and flat. It has right now with that convexity that occurs in the bottom of the container, has a little bit of wobble. So I'm actually gonna space that piece with a piece of bamboo once the stone is in the container. I'm not gonna do so now. This piece fits right alongside. Notice how close this block is to this wire. As long as the wire can come straight up and not move the block out of that path, we're fine. If for whatever reason this wire were in the middle of the block, we could drill a hole in the center of the block that would hold it in place and not impede that ability for the stone to set and the wire to anchor. Now, once we have these blocks figured out, this is a crux moment because we've got to come back and we've got to create some sort of flexible padding between the block itself and the bottom of the container. And this is where gasket rubber is so important. A okay, gasket rubber comes in a variety of thicknesses and also we can get it in very large sheets. And what we want to do is we want to cut a piece of gasket rubber that basically covers the whole contact of that block on the bottom of the container. So I'm just going to cut a rough size and then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to trim that down so it sits underneath the edges of that block and we don't have it overlapping and working against us in our tie down wires. Now we can see that the rubber's not hanging out anywhere. That's a perfect sort of fit for that block. That feels really good. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna provide a fit for this block as well. Notice that we have the wire that holds our drain screen and I have pads on both sides of that so that we still have space for soil to exist in and for water to leave that system. Now as far as the concrete footing is gonna go, 
I've got these bamboo pieces that are relatively thin. I want to find two bamboo pieces that are of a same or similar thickness for the central portion of this container. And I notice that these two pieces, when I just look at the body of those pieces, they're very, very similar in their thickness. That's going to establish a similar distribution of height. Now on the bottom of this container, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to place these sort of loosely in here where I feel like these are going to be really nice and supportive, evenly distributed across the bottom of that container. This is when I can come back to this piece that I had initially cut that I have double the thickness on and let's go ahead and test this and see how this is going to work. So I'll place that in the bottom there. This is where the concrete will touch. I'll go ahead and use my board and lo and behold, it's a perfect thickness to be able to gain that same level across all of those pieces that exist in the container. So now that we have that set up, everything that we need is ready as far as the container is concerned. Okay, stone number one. So again, because I've maintained the orientation, I know that this foot right here is the one where I actually have a much wider block where those are gonna be coming through the foot, as opposed to going down through that foot where we had planned on one wire passing through this hole, one wire being on the outside and tying them here. I actually need to go through the foot in this direction for it to pass through. And we wanna make sure that we leave enough stone or enough concrete, depending on what the material that the stone feature is being created out of, to be able to hold that in and not break out and separate from the composition. I'm gonna go ahead and take my same tile bit, okay? And I'm gonna open up a hole through here that I can freely access the wires with. Now this stone, this is, these are Jan Kulik stones, is a resin component. Resin doesn't need the same cooling because it's not as abrasive as ceramic body or concrete itself. Okay, very, very easy to drill through. This is one of the best parts about Jan's work is it's so easy to work with based on how he composes his pieces. Now for this one, I am going to go straight down through this because I've got enough of a footprint here that I feel like I'm going to have stability. I'm going to go straight down into the stone right here. Okay, as far as we're concerned, stone number two is ready to be inserted. Now for stone number one, we're going to be going through concrete and because the stone sits directly over this concrete pad, let me rotate so you guys can see this, my chalk mark is right here directly underneath the stone. So I'm just going to lay this stone back on its side here, being very, very careful to make sure to not compromise it. I would imagine I'm somewhere right in here. Let me go ahead and just check. Now I'm probably going to need to use water as a coolant on this one. We won't know until we start drilling how dense the concrete is and how much resin he utilized with the concrete to create, create this really stable platform. And now I need to bring in soil and insert it in around all of those blocks because we need soil in that negative airspace underneath the stones in order to be able to hold these in place and also facilitate the kind of root growth that we're striving to achieve. This is a big part of success in creating a stone planted composition when we anchor the stone into a container. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to put in a really nice minimal amount of aeration layer into the container. And because the blocks are where they need to be and everything is set up, this aeration layer is going to serve to kind of lock some of this into place. Now, we have to understand our strategy when we go about putting soil into the container. Because we can't get underneath these stones when they have a big platform like that, if we don't put that soil in there, it creates an airspace that's really detrimental to the dynamic of water oxygen balance in the container. 
I'm just going to use this aeration layer right around the edges and the low points of this container and fill the rest of it with interior soil. If you have a flat bottom container, your blocks rest solidly on the bottom of it. You fill up with an aeration interior on top of that to the height of the blocks. That's the piece of information you need. Again, this stone composition is really sort of the worst case scenario for how we go about handling this situation. It's good to see this. It gets easier and easier as the container is more conventional. I don't want the soil bearing the weight of the stone because it will settle over the course of time and we'll start to get some slack in that system that will lose the anchoring that we're going to be applying to these stones. So this is really important that we get this piece done correctly. Okay, now this stone that doesn't have the concrete foundation is a little bit easier to work with because we know we have a scenario here where we can actually put soil in around it. It doesn't have that limitation. But Handling it the same way so that everything is stabilized, still a good practice. So if we need help, somebody to lift the stone, totally, totally acceptable. You're going to watch me struggle with it all by myself, which is possible. Now, once I get that wire through, one thing that I like to do is I like to fold that wire. And what folding that wire does is it makes sure that it doesn't come out as I'm getting the second wire into place. I also want to make sure that this wire stays nice and straight and doesn't get bent. My mark is right in line here. My mark is right in line in the front. We've already secured it to a point where that stone, look at how solid that is, virtually immobile. Okay, so I've got this other touch point right here where the concrete is relatively close. I just slipped a little pad of rubber in there. Now in terms of a bridge, we're going to take a piece of bamboo. We've got the hard side and we've got the soft side. I'm going to strip off some of that interior softness and I'm going to separate it from the hardness. Now I'm not going to take all of it away and the thickness of this depends on the force that we're going to be applying. So I've got a fairly good chunk of bamboo there but it's a little bit reduced from what it was. Now the reason that I split this in half is if this bamboo is super wide and we try to fit it through these two pieces and the bamboo is wider than the hole right there, then the wire has to come up and around it and we'll never get a secure tie down. So if I go ahead and thin it so it's not the width of the hole, it's less than, one wire can come up one side, one wire can come on the other side, and we can go ahead and just reduce the length of this piece to a functional point that bridges that hole. Top side is the, or the hard side is the top side. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pull nice and snug here. I'm gonna pull nice and snug here, and I'm just gonna crank that down so that we're nice and tight and anchored into the container. So now these two pieces are anchored together. They feel really good in terms of their, their hold in the container. Container moves, not the stones. That means that we're ready to start the actual composition. Now that we're at this point, 
I'm not going to add any more soil. I want to have the freedom to be able to take soil out. We're going to have muck falling into the container. Now we actually get to, for the first time, start conceptualizing this piece. And when we start to place the pieces, always start placing the main tree first. The main tree, just like the defining branch in design, dictates the structure and layout of everything else. And I have this really interesting upright piece the only upright piece in the composition that has a little bit of a taller trunk and a thicker root spread. And my initial concept with this piece is that it's either going to fit here or potentially up in here. Now we're going to play with this compositionally. This is really when we get to have fun. This feels fairly standard, feels fairly normal. Before we move forward, I just want to play with what does it look like to shift that piece? Kind of interesting, kind of. Let's see how the other ones work. Okay, so if we have that piece there, we're kind of starting to create a composition where we're going to have some lower pieces in here and we're going to create some pieces that are hanging down here. Let's try to find a few pieces that have this sort of interesting movement and interaction. We want to keep them lower than this. This may not be where we go. This might be better, but we have to exhaust all options. What would this look like here? Or maybe even here for depth? Well, that feels possible. It even feels interesting. Ooh. Ooh. Could be kind of magical. I need pieces for depth, I need differences in height, and I need to create asymmetry in the composition. Now this stone moving to the right and this being relatively flat, we've already set the tone that we're compressing here and that we're running out here. Now there's another interesting concept. We could push against this and actually run out this way. Let's play. Let's see what we got. This feels a little two-dimensional here. I'm going to go ahead and shift that one to the back. Okay, now another thing that I'm looking at is referencing sort of the Nabari. How would that fit on a stone? How would that cling to the stone? How would that exist? I'm looking for asymmetry. What's this piece going to be right here? Or does this even exist? I see this piece really giving me that dramatic sort of windswept appearance. That's an interesting piece for right there. I like that. We don't want to create two dimensions. These stones are moving towards you. Right? But if we have them all, all the trees running linearly, we really nullify that engagement. There we go. There we go. Let's show down into that movement. Now these root masses are going to be shrunk down significantly. So we really want to make sure that we're not kind of creating the composition to accommodate the root mass that we're seeing. And we want to make sure that they all interact. I'm not sure I like the spacing. Notice how the spacing here very equal in terms of the tree. If I'm going to use this piece, I'm going to bring this piece up into here. Let's go ahead and see what that looks like. I like that dropping down there with that piece over in there. That'll be leveraged up a little bit more. Let's come back to this piece here. Love these big thick roots right here. Now that we have this composition in place, we're going to start the planting process. And the planting process looks something like this. I'm going to take the composition apart one tree at a time. I'm going to take that root system and I'm really going to conform it to the space on the stone so that it fits. When I'm conforming it, I'm also thinking to myself, where are the roots going to go and how are we going to organize them to carry them from this vertical place all the way down to this container in as few of the soil trails as we can possibly create. So I don't want all of the root systems to have their own path and for this whole stone to be consumed by muck that's hiding all of the stone. I want to show as much of the stone as possible. It is still the main point of this composition. So I have to organize my roots to be able to find that path to interconnect as they move down to the soil in order to be able to make sure that stone stays the focal point of the composition. Main tree comes off the stone now in this position and I want to change the angle so that I orient this slightly forward. That orientation as it was, as you were looking at it, was slightly to the back and I really want to show this tree forward to get all of the movement that we can but also set so that it engages the viewer. So I'm going to go ahead and work the root system. Now if you notice this contour of the stone here and let me step out of the way. Very very thin ridge right up the center of the root mass. That means that when I come back to this this tree and I'm working this root mass I've got to reduce to fit that location and really take that ridge out of the middle of this root mass. So if I want my tree to be here, 
that is moving right down this center. I'm just going to give myself a little bit of a mark so that I know where to work. So I'm going to hold the tree right at that position and just take out that center ridge. And I'm going to go as far, leaving these roots intact, go as far as I possibly can until I hit a limitation in the root system. Because the deeper that this sits down onto the stone, the more effective it's going to be towards meshing and making it look as if it grew in that location. In the breakdown of the root system to conform it to the stone, one of the fundamental things that we need to understand is that as opposed to a standard repot where we're sort of dismantling the bottom of the root mass, the top of the root mass and the sides, we really need to be leaving some portion of the root mass intact and we need to be taking away those features in the stone that allow that root mass to seat on the stone. The idea here is that the tree grew organically from this point from a seedling to the mature piece that it is now. And in order to give that impression, the tighter that it fits to the stone and the more contoured the root mass is to the stone, the more effective the composition is going to be. And I'm gonna continually come back and reference sort of that seated position that I can create with this tree just to make sure that I've got it in the position that I want it to be in. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna establish that that's a great position. And I'm gonna go ahead and start the reduction of this outer mass and see if I can expose some of these big, thick, heavy roots that look like they would be gripping the stone. We need to contour the tree to fit to the stone. This is part of the technique of a good stone composition. Okay, now these big long roots where we would typically cut these in the repotting process, we're gonna be looking at these roots as the pieces that kind of circle through here and create those trails of the root system. Now we wanna show as little soil as possible while making sure each tree has enough to survive. So as we're doing this and we're raking out these roots, we're not thinking, okay, I'm gonna cut those off. We're thinking some of them are gonna get cut off, a lot of them are gonna get redirected and we're gonna use that length to start actually moving down the soil system and creating that bridge from the upper stone down to the container. Okay, I have this beautiful route as I pick these up and I look at where these are gonna go. Notice this, this sort of track that exists right here. Along this stone, I've got a nice ledge and then I've got this inset right here. So I'm looking at these big long roots and I'm thinking these big long roots are gonna lay right in here and that tree is gonna sit right there. It's been reduced significantly to fit the stone. Now, when we're trying to figure out anchoring strategy for the tree on the stone, we've gotta be looking at where are the solid points on this root mass that are gonna hold that position. I've got one solid point on this side and I've got the most important solid point right here around this thicker root on this side. I'm not gonna tie over the root necessarily, but I'm gonna use that compression point to hold the angle, and I'm gonna anchor here to hold it firm. So I'm gonna add just a little hole, just a little hole. I'm gonna give myself a little mark right there just to create a point where I can use some anchor wire. I'll show you guys how to prepare that and how to drill it. Now I also need a hole straight down from this point here, and as I open that up, I start to look and that hole is gonna be right in this area here. I've got another thin area in the stone. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna use this thin area in the stone. I actually have a little hole right here, but it's not right where I want it. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new hole right in this area, right here, to be able to get two wires up through each point on that root system. Now, in order to get the wire up on that root system, I know my anchor point is right here. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna open up a little hole for that wire to pass through so that we make sure we can get something up in there very effortlessly. I've got this big thick root right here that we talked about. I'm gonna pass another chopstick through that just to be able to get something up and through there and have it be accurate to where we need those tie downs to occur in order to be able to anchor this accurately. Now notice what we've got here. We still have a very intact root mass. We've got a lot of exposed roots. We've got some of those longer pieces. I continue to spray this to keep it hydrated. You don't have to worry if they do dry out a little bit. It's not a big deal. As we're working these root systems, one of the things we need to always keep in mind is not clogging up all of this beautiful soil. I didn't proactively do so, but now I'm seeing some of the soil from the contouring fall through. I'm just gonna take my rag and place it over the open surfaces of the soil immediately under the area that I'm working so that we can go ahead and pull that out and it doesn't integrate into the containerized environment. Because this is a resin stone and not a, a real stone, I can use a regular bit to go ahead and drill through it. If you're dealing with real stone, you would have to stick with the tile bit we utilized on the container. Either one is just as appropriate. Adjust your tools to the material that you're working with. 
but let's go ahead and create that space for that tie down wire to be executed and placed into the stone. Couldn't pull back fast enough. So now we went all the way through, not a problem. Let's go ahead and see how we want to anchor it. Now, for this anchoring, I'm still gonna stick with my steel. We could go with aluminum here because we're dealing with a much smaller tree, but we still want that really tight hold. When anchoring a tree to stone, there's so many different strategies that we can start to implement to be able to effectively get that secure hold of the tree to that stone. And Ultimately, this comes down to having a big bag of tricks, but also creatively utilizing the stone and working with the stone to be able to maximize that anchoring capacity while also minimizing the visibility of those anchors. Tonight, we're working with Jan Kulik stones, which are resin concrete compositions. And inside of that, it's very easy to drill and add some of those holes to be able to pass those anchor wires through. Oftentimes, we'll be working with a natural stone or something that's a lot harder which means that we're not able to necessarily penetrate the stone or we may have a situation where we don't want to add a hole all the way through the surface of the stone. This is where we're going to start to work with using composites and utilizing some sort of bonding agent to secure that wire into those pockets. Always be sure that you're working creatively and finding those opportunities to minimize visibility. This is a big part of stone planting composition. Now watch how I handle this. I'm gonna take my pliers and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna compress that. I'm gonna put my finger kind of in the middle of that so that it pinches around my finger like so to create the smallest possible location. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna fold that diagonally so that it's not straight back but it's just, just slightly diagonally folded. So as I pull up against here, you notice that the hook is kind of sitting outside of it. I'm gonna to try to compress this so that the hook, the pointed end, if I fully compress it, the pointed end is narrow, the ex exterior, exterior end or the outer side of that is a little bit wider and we basically bury it in that hole and get that caught. Notice how I've compressed here and I've got this wider spot and as I try to pull through, if I can just seat that right in that hole, then we start to disguise that wire so that that wire isn't visible. Okay, and I'm just gonna kind of wedge it in there. Now, we wanna be very, very careful with stone. Stone breaks, stone fractures. We're dealing with very thin connective areas. We have to have a little bit more delicacy when we're dealing with stone. So we can't quite crank with the same amount of force as we would in a ceramic vessel because of that delicacy. We're always functioning on a fine line of success and failure. Okay, anchor wire number one is in place. I feel really good about that. Let's come back and let's go ahead and hit anchor wire number two. Those are gonna come up and through the root system. That's seated, now it's anchored into the stone. I can go ahead and shorten one and because these are coming through the root system, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna tie these tips together. Now, we need to do this so that this creates one unified wire. I'm gonna shorten these so that these are roughly the same length as this so I can feed them through at the same time ideally or close to it. So we've got the same length that we're trying to work with when we're pulling these through. So first things first, I'm gonna brush off all of the debris from the drilling and from working the root system. A little water holding pocket right here. I'm gonna put a little hole in that just so we can get a little bit of drainage through here. Even on a stone, you can get roots kind of sitting in there, but the bigger thing is if it holds water, that water works up into the root system, can cause that imbalance. So I'm gonna over apply muck, not in terms of thickness, but in terms of the surface that the roots are gonna exist. And then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna pull the muck away once we've got the roots on this piece. And I'm gonna use an ample amount of muck to get into these recessed areas. Not so much that I can't fit the roots in there, but if I have muck, I can press the roots into the muck and it sort of engulfs them and creates a water oxygen balance that allows them to thrive. So one thing that I wanna be really careful of is that I don't overly thin the muck on this uh, saddle where the tree's gonna sit, but I also don't wanna keep it too thick because if it's too thick, I'm gonna have a hard time setting the tree down into it. I'm 
I'm gonna take just a handful of muck. Okay, just a nice, nice little palm full. Okay, almost to where it's squeezable liquid. And I'm just gonna set this right along this saddle so that this can ooze up into that soil system right there. Right, we don't have any way to get up underneath this tree. We create a center mound when we mount this in a container. Now that we're starting to work this on a stone, we wanna make sure that we have the same ability to adjust and adapt. Okay, I'm gonna moisten this root system. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna come back to my angle. I've got my chopsticks here. I'm gonna start with one and then the other, kind of following that chopstick as it works up through the root system. There's that one. Okay, chopsticks out. Wire here, wire here. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put some pressure on those and I'm gonna make sure that my roots don't get caught underneath that. I'm just gonna set that right on top, pull those wires nice and taut so that they're not caught underneath that and now you'll start to see that the tree is gonna stick to that area because we've got that muck underneath it. When we squish that down, all that wet muck just went bleh, up into that soil and up into that root mass and that's exactly what we were looking to achieve. Okay, we're a little bit closer to vertical than we were, not bad. So we need to put a little more pressure here. That means that we're gonna tie on this side first. And if you remember, when I pulled here, see how that changes that angle and it pulls it that way? That's exactly how we're gonna go about. Notice how that squeezes down. I can maybe settle it just a little bit more, always supporting the stone. Okay, and that kind of sets that first tree. This is, again, this is the basis for the whole composition. It's stable, it's not coming off. I can't pick it up and off, but the root system wants to warp and sort of work on that vertical spine. That's okay. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut these relatively flush. Try to hide that wire. Anything that I do to overly moisten this area now is gonna impact the muck that I have on it. So I wanna be very, very careful. Okay, now notice what I have here. I've got kind of a big long root. I'm gonna put this actually up and underneath these roots and watch how I seat this piece right here. I'm just gonna press it right into that muck. Notice how I'm just pressing it into that muck and I'm gonna take some of my muck scrap here and I'm just gonna cover that root to have a layer of soil between the roots so that I don't cake them together. I'm gonna pull these over. I'm gonna press them into that muck that I just used as my separator. Okay, not, not caking these together. You don't wanna cake your roots together. That'll lead to root death for sure. Muck is this very fluid, sort of chunky, falling apart, difficult medium to utilize in the securing of the roots and the handling of this attachment to the stone. But we have to be strategic in the way that we utilize muck. As you're working with muck, don't be afraid for the muck to fall apart. Don't be afraid for the roots to not totally adhere at first. Continue to work with the process. Learn that tactile sensation. Always focus on tucking in, tucking in, tucking in. Utilize big chunks of muck when you choose to utilize it. Make sure muck exists between the stone and the root system and you will have ultimate success as you learn that tactile sensation and the boundaries of where muck can be manipulated to fit your purpose. Now this piece is even less worked than the piece that we just started with and we know that this trunk line needs to be above needs to be above parallel when we're looking at it from the front. So my orientation is gonna be here.
I don't want this big, huge mess of fine roots. They'll just stick together. So I'm gonna prune those relatively short. Some of these longer pieces up here, I'm gonna prune back and create a really nice system there. All my length is on the bottom. Okay, that feels pretty good. I'm comfortable with that. We'll solidify it with the Kato. Now we've got those two pieces in place. Let's go ahead and work the third, and then we'll tie the whole thing together with muck. Okay, we've got two trees mounted. I'm gonna go ahead and mount this third one. Follow that process for this dead vertical face so that you kind of see the horizontal, the semi-vertical, and the completely vertical. Once you've seen all of those, you literally have all the tools that you need to be able to complete the rest of the composition. Now you've seen how to mount a tree to a horizontal surface, a semi-vertical surface, and a completely vertical surface. You have anchoring strategies to tie to structure or to use the bridge method. I'm going to go ahead and take these exact same techniques and apply them to the rest of the trees on the stone. We're going to come back and we're going to watch how we now place the Kato over the root masses, connect the roots to run them down to the container, and finish off this stone planting composition. I want to walk you through the steps of how we go about organizing the, these roots, creating those paths, and really setting the tone for getting those down to the container so that we can have that reservoir that these trees will eventually lean on for their survivability, water, and nutrition. Okay, so I'm going to start at the top here. I've got all of these roots sticking off of the surface. It doesn't do me any good to try and coat the surface with muck. That's going to dry out very easily. It's going to be the first thing that dries in the sun. It's going to crumble away. And if we have this muck tied into the muck on the walls or on, on the underside of the roots, that'll start to cause the whole system to fall apart. So I'm really going to focus right in this area here. And when I start to take this initial muck that we laid in to anchor this tree, I'm just going to kind of tuck in the edges of this to find that contour of the stone. Notice I'm just kind of letting the stone sort of guide my chopstick. I'm, I'm sort of teasing out that muck in those pockets and I'm making sure that that muck is in good contact with this root system. Anywhere that I have these roots that are kind of protruding, if I can, I'm going to tuck them down into that muck and that starts to create my edges where I can come back and now apply a layer of muck. Nice and thick and robust. I don't want this big ball of muck but I want a healthy chunk of muck because the thinner this is, the faster it dries and the faster it falls apart. So I'm going to take a relatively formative piece here and I'm going to start to squeeze it into this area and just really work it in and then take my chopstick right along the edge of that stone and work that muck into those areas so that we do have good contact. For the first year of this, we're going to have to really work hard to keep this hydrated so that this muck stays, cultivates moss, cultivates roots, and stays intact as the tree establishes itself on the stone. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that that portion of muck, notice how it's real flexible on the surface, I'm getting it tied into those roots. I can give it just a little bit of water to moisten it up so that it does have some ability to, to gel and sort of fold over those roots. I can tuck roots in and then come back and fold the muck over the top.
seeing how I handle this vertical root mass is going to be, I think, very fruitful for you all to understand because most of us are probably thinking, I want to create a stone planting. I have a rock. How do I mount a tree to the side of it? This is, this is that moment. Okay, so I'm just going to lock that in. I've got this undercut here. Okay, and I'm going to kind of feed that keto. down. Now, notice that I didn't wet the keto because if I wet it, it's not going to stay. It's not going to integrate into the system. Okay, and what I'm doing here is I'm just, kind of, I'm just kind of forming my mass that I have the ability to work. And if I can form this mass and then undertuck it and tie it all together, it should stay together. And that's our goal. So I'm just going to continue to kind of form this mass. I'm going to get up underneath it. As we round out a stone planted composition, really being sure that we understand the dynamics of muck as it hardens and secures itself to that stone is a big part of our success. For three or four days, it's going to take that muck some time to shed that extra water that exists in it. And if we're watering that normally, really panicked about the application of water and the hydration of those trees, we could dismantle everything we took the time to create. I like that movement. Notice how that moves through the stone. That starts to create a lot of interest when that turns to moss. Okay, so I'm gonna fill up the container leaving that quarter to eighth inch space on the rim of the container knowing that there's going to be a lot of water applied to this over this coming year to keep these hydrated as they form the roots that get down to the container. The last thing we want to do at this point is overfill and really start to create a system that's going to, as the water runs off of this stone, blast all of that soil out and we're going to have to come back and fix it continuously. So I want to be focused on making sure that I integrate any soil into the spaces between the stone. And I also want to make sure just to have a chopstick so that as I fill this up, I get soil underneath these feet in these areas. Notice that as I chopstick, I'm just getting them underneath the feet and inside of those blocks and those spaces. As you can see, now that that's integrated, it really starts to finish off that composition and look like, oh, very cool. That, that added little touch. We want to be embedding and implanting moss spores into that wet muck that will have the ability to cultivate and grow and occupy that kato so that we lock everything around this rock planting together with that outer casing of that moss. What I have here is I've got a dried out tray of moss that we've taken off the surfaces of trees that we've been repotting over the past couple weeks. We just set this out in the sun or in Portland, Oregon, oftentimes in the greenhouse where we hope it dries out. Um, we've gotten a few sunny days. We've got a really nice dry tray of moss here. Much like creating the top dressing, we've got our quarter inch screen here that we're going to be grinding this green moss over. We've got our sixteenth here that we're going to sift out the fines with. And I'm just going to go ahead and create some of the green moss and show you guys how to embed it into this muck so that we're able to inoculate it with that moss that's going to ultimately stabilize the entire system. When we start to apply this, I'm just going to use my chopstick just to push it into the muck that we've set into this system. So notice that I'm just holding that pinch up there and I'm really pressing that moss into it. If we just try to sprinkle it on the surface, when we come back and water, all of it's going to wash off. We really need to embed this moss. Be sure that you allow the muck to establish itself 
and really embed that moss into the muck so that you start to occupy that environment with that protective coating of moss that's going to one, bind everything together, but also two, help hydrate those pieces where we've thinned out that root system on that exposed surface of stone to give that tree the time for those roots to get down to the container and give that composition success. And I don't want to really mar up the Kato. I want to be careful because it's still very soft, but this is so easy to do. And it's one thing that we want to take the time to go ahead and do while the Kato is very soft because of the ease with which we can implant this. Okay, and what you can see there is you can just see the muck starting to take on a little bit of a green tint. That means that we've got enough moss in there that we're going to have good thorough coverage and occupation. Don't be too uh, obsessed with getting every single piece of Kato embedded with moss. We can go ahead and space it out a little bit. Some areas are going to have more, some areas are going to have less. Just make sure that you try to get as thorough of a coverage as you possibly can. And then we're going to go ahead and take this into the workshop, complete this operation, move this to the greenhouse out of wind, out of sun, let that Kato and that muck slowly solidify over the next three or four days. If this upper area dries a little bit, we'll use the spray bottle just a little bit of moisture to wet that down and that's all the watering that we're going to be doing over the course of the next three or four days, okay? The aftercare of a stone composition isn't that much different than a freshly repotted tree. However, we have to consider the preparation of the material as one of the big components to how we provide that aftercare. Having that foliage mass drive that root growth is a big part of success and not trying to overwork a tree prior to putting it on a stone is one of those aspects of the fine sort of motor skills and knowledge that allows us to create that stone planted composition with success. If we're understanding of the time frame and we understand the energy allocation of the tree, we're able to keep that foliage mass hydrated out of direct wind, out of sun, potentially misting it to a degree with a fine spray bottle in the initial week or so after the creation, and really allowing those roots to start to occupy that soil environment and help those trees reestablish. Be careful with your water, keep the tree foliage mass hydrated, allow the muck to solidify, and only after those things have taken place and we've really gotten that stone planting starting to acclimate to the stone environment, do we come back and start to deal with water and worrying about the interior soil environment of the container itself. Once we understand these components and we start to experience these things occurring, we start to have a much more natural ability to gauge and manipulate our technique to what that stone composition is needing. All of these things are the beautiful aspects of being able to play with an accessible piece of material, planting it on a stone, and, and starting to understand how that composition comes to fruition. I'm really excited for you guys to be able to take these techniques, apply them, bring those ideas to life, but also to learn and understand all of those dynamics that go into this most organic shape and form of bonsai. Have fun with this. Don't let it be intimidating attack it, go after it, utilize the techniques and take the time on the front end of creating the composition to be able to set yourself up for years and years of successful cultivation. I hope you guys have gotten every single thing that you need to be able to create a stone composition. And I again want to remind you, although we took this farther than a single tree on a stone, all of the concepts that are involved here, from the stone selection creating our inspiration for the composition, to the container selection that maximizes the vi visibility of a stone, to the way that we handle the root system and we start to mount it to the stone, anchoring to the stone, handling of the roots on the stone, creating that muck that binds all of that together down to the soil, finishing off that soil, finishing off that muck, allowing it to recover, knowing the way that muck behaves, and eventually coming back and styling that tree, you have every single point of how to create a stone composition, and I encourage you, please try this. It's one of the most beautiful, true to form, natural reflections in miniature that we can utilize the art of bonsai to create, and it will forever be one of the most charming things that we end up engaging with in a composition and creation. You're gonna enjoy it, you have the techniques to execute it, get adventurous, and make that come to life. Thank you guys. Hope you enjoyed this. 
We thoroughly enjoyed it. I love creating stone compositions and uh, I look forward to seeing everything that you guys create this coming spring. Share it with us on Mirai Live, the forum, Apex Forum, and let us see what you guys are up to. Thanks for watching Bonsai Mirai. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like, you can sign up for a free trial of Mirai Live at live.bonsaimirai.com.